Hi, everybody. Okay, so I'm going to do my lecture on uh, cardiothoracic, sorry, thoracic and pulmonary surgery. So that's what I wanted to uh, separate for you. So your chapter 22 is cardiothoracic surgery, but it is separated. This chapter is thoracic and pulmonary, and next week will just be cardiac to just make it easier for you guys. So I'm going to share my screen now so you can see my thoracic surgery slideshow as I go. This time it's going to work. Uh, but that way, um, that way you can separate the two surgeries a little bit easier. When I was taught this, it uh, was all together. So this should make it a lot easier for you guys to separate and understand the different kinds of surgery. So I really like thoracic surgery and lung surgeries. Uh, a lot of lobectomies. Uh, you'll see in your book, uh, uh, so excuse me, you'll see in your book that cancer ca caused from cigarette smoking is extremely common, the most common in, in the United States. So you're going to be doing a lot of surgeries for that reason. So let's start with the introduction. So thoracic surgery, um, the lungs are going to be your primary focus, but I want you to know what all they're working on. So chest wall deformities, lesions within the mediastinum, and then the three different cases that we're gonna discuss that are diagnostic are bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, and thoroscopy. So I'm pointing this out because these are surgical procedures technically. So like bronchoscopy, we could remove a foreign body. Mediastinoscopy, you're, you could take some uh, biopsies of lymph nodes. Thoroscopy, we could do a wedge lung resection through that. So yes, there could be just diagnostic procedures, but they could also be more involved procedures. So I wanted to point that out from the very beginning. So I'll go back a slide now. So know your mediastinum and that anatomy and that introductory paragraph. So that includes your heart esophagus and your thymus, if you don't remember that anatomy. And then looking at your diagnostic procedures and tests, you'll see why I have this chest x-ray up. So, They'll be looking at chest x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, and pulmonary angiography, especially for vascular cases. So lots of diagnostic tests and procedures. Um, there's more like electrocardiography, echocardiography, and then all the cases we've learned about in the cardiac cath lab. So all of those can be diagnostic tests too. I put the picture of the chest x-ray on here for a reason. No, you're not expected to know how to read this. But for me, when I was in the thoracic room and they were planning out the surgery, where they were going to make the incisions, where the tumor was, trying to plan and make a plan of attack, if I could understand what they were talking about and pay attention, I could anticipate better. I knew, you know, how long the incision was going to be, so what type of retractor to get, or maybe I'm going to need longer instruments if it's really deep into the body cavity. If you listen and pay attention, you can anticipate better. So that is why I put all of that anatomical, all those anatomical features on your chest x-ray for you. So you can look over that. So again, you can understand these conversations that these doctors are having in the rooms. But lots of different imaging for uh, di diagnostic procedures and tests. Um, and then it reminds you one more time, right above your picture of your pulmonary arteriogram, it reminds you there's three definitive diagnostic procedures for diagnosis of suspected lesions. So that's usually some form of lung cancer or thoracic cancer. So these three are bronchoscopy, mediastinoscopy, and thoroscopy, as I've said. As you see thoroscopy in your book, I want you to put that hand in hand with VATS because that's video assisted thor thoroscopic um, surgery. So same thing, that's. So uh, as you can see, I added the page numbers on here too to make it a little bit easier for you as you are studying. Okay, so after that, I get into thoracic surgery supplies. I want you to take a pause and grab your orange book. So as you saw, your peripheral vascular uh, chapter went through some of these instruments, but they're going to be used in basically all three different courses. So the stuff from peripheral vascular is going to bleed, pun intended, into uh, thoracic and pulmonary and bleed into cardiac surgery. So they all go together. They all use similar instrumentation. 
So I want to go over some that it goes over in your book, but I want to point it out in the orange book so you study the details. So page 355, I'm starting with instrumentation. So Duval forceps and the Lovelace forceps. So these are both used to grasp onto the lung, especially the Duval. Um, used in thoracic procedures, it looks very similar to a Pennington forcep. So know both of those. Looking at page 356, you'll see the Forrester sponge forceps, which you know, but there's longer versions of that for thoracic surgery, especially VATS. So look at your Holman tunneling forceps. We never called it that, we just called it a long Forrester, but that's what we used on VATS procedures. So make sure you know both of those. As far as the scissors and the other instrumentations, they're just going to be longer for these. So longer and, you know, delicate tips for vascular and thicker for bigger uh, soft tissue areas. So I want you to flip to page 361. So on 361, it starts with the really cool rib shears. So rib cutters to cut through. And then the one we use more commonly on 362, the shoemaker rib shears. So this one has a little loop so it can loop around the rib and then you just clamp the rest of it like a ronger. You just grasp the rest of it with your hand and it will cut that rib for you. So rib cutters, cool instruments. And then a doyen rib stripper. You should definitely know that one. That's to scrape that periosteum off of the rib. So it's just like a periosteal elevator, but it wraps around the rib and scrapes it off. Very cool. Uh, calipers to measure all these graphs. I want you to flip over to page 364. Look at your wolf suction. So your wolf suction is a really long gank hour suction. So very commonly used in VATS thoracic procedures. They've got a similar one that's a long version of the pool suction. Look at page 365. So these are thoracotomy instruments. So we're opening, we're not doing what I'm talking about today. We're doing open thoracotomy with the rib spreader and the sternal saw. Very cool. So let's start with Allison Retractor. So the Allison Retractor, we always called this the whisk or the egg beater, <laughs> but lots of different names, but it clearly looks like a whisk. So that's a common nickname for it. Uh, another one with a nickname, your Davidson Retractor. So this one's a very unique looking retractor. Very cool, but it is to retract the scapula. So we called it the scapula retractor. Some people call it the spatula retractor because it does look like a spatula. So you've got two instruments that could very easily be mistaken for kitchen items. Maybe you'll see that in your lab pictures of your setups. I don't know. But go ahead and flip it over to page 367. So 367, I want you to really know this one, your finished shadow rib retractor. So this one's rib spreader is the other one it's called, but you need to know how to attach the blades uh, to them so they can use the hand crank to basically crank open the sternum. So they're going to put one on either side after they split the sternum, crank it open to split that open. So Finichetto Retractor. And then looking at page 368, you'll see your Bailey Retractor. So this actually brings them back together so you can use sternal wire to approximate them back together. So used in pairs, this is the Bailey or the Lemon Retractor, but used in pairs to approximate the sternum for closure. And remember, we can use that sternal wire for closure, so you'll need wire drivers in addition to this instrument. <clears throat> uh, the opposite for very fine stuff like vascular um, suture, you'll need a rider needle holder. So that's on page 369. So very fine, um, like anastomosis type suture, you'll need that one for. After that, we're going to do a big skip. Yes, to page 375. So 375, I want you to read over this page and know it very well because it goes over some instrument, sorry, some supplies that I talked about in vascular surgery that I'm not going to go over again, like shods and suture boots. It also talks about different things to do, like say if your facility doesn't have shods and you need them, it gives you an idea of what else you can do in its place. So make sure you read through page 375. It has lots of useful information in it, especially in the summary. So I'm going to talk about chest tubes today, 
As you're studying it, you need to go to page 375 and read the summary. It talks about the water seal drainage system and how your pleurivac drainage system is going to work in the OR. So that's everything I have for your orange book. I will flip back to the slideshow now. So as far as in your book instrumentation, okay, look at instrumentation, that paragraph in your book, page 995. So for thoracotomy, I just went over the rib shears, the rib spreaders, elevators, long instruments at least nine inches long. I talked about the sternal saw and then where it says retractor, that'd be your finichetto. And then hemoclip pliers and silk ties and all that stuff is the same with peripheral vascular surgery. So after instrumentation, it gets into the supplies and they should be very similar. But I will go over those for you. I want to point out, because I'm not going to go over them, all of your instruments on page 996. You should know all of those. All right. So now I can flip back to supplies. So now you can follow my slideshow. I'm going to start with, I believe, it skips through some of these supplies actually. It starts with incised drape. So I'm on page 995. So you'll see my plastic incised drape and that's your IOBAN right here. So that's what it's talking about. We use this on peripheral vascular also and cardiac cases. Silk ties are throughout the chapter. So no, that's not next on your list, but I wanted to point out, we talked about in peripheral vascular surgery, we talked about this in the lab actually, putting lots of different silk ties underneath your Mayo scan. So thoracic surgery is a good, another good example of when you're gonna have multiple different sizes of silk ties. So I liked to, underneath the towel of my Mayo, lay out all my different silk ties underneath that towel. So that means they're not in that blue square package anymore. You've taken them out of there completely and laid them out in full length underneath a towel on your Mayo stand. Now you can attach these to your Mayo stand with maybe a little label from, um, to label your saline and your medications, or you can use anything else to make it stick. As long as you can easily access 0203040 silk ties at all times to where you can pass it to them how they're using it right here. You know, you might pass it to them on a debakey or a right angle or a tonsil. So you guys are used to just the easy, right? You do tie on a pass. Well, when you get more into vascular surgery, especially thoracic, they might ask for it a different way. So they might ask you to hand it to them on a debakey or feed it to them right here, like in the picture, they might be feeding that tie under that vessel to the surgeon. So just know that it might be a little more involved and you'll need multiple different sizes of silk ties and hemoglobes. Okay, so after it talks about that, you can find where it says, um, Magnet instrument pad. Magnet instrument pad. So this is just going to help catch the instruments that might have fallen on the ground otherwise because there's just a lot of moving parts and a lot of things going on. So there's a lot of cases that this magnetic instrument pad has been on there and I didn't really show you a picture of it. So it's not very important. Uh, it just is nice to have available. So they have it on ENT head and neck cases also, but it's very convenient if you have that available. So that's just some of the supplies. Let's look at some more. So let's flip over to page 997. So I already went over, you need cell saver for certain cases. When you need it, when you don't, the tubing and the actual machine that you need to do this, right? You would say, right. So <laughs> because I've already done that, what I did was just attach the link for cell saver on here. So maybe you could watch this again and really see how it's used and what it can be used for. So because you know the supplies already, I want you to think bigger picture what they're actually doing with it. So that's why that one's on there. After that, I get really into the chest tube. So let's skip to that part, chest tubes, and then right underneath it, it says closed seal drainage unit. I'm gonna go over both of those, adding notes. So your chest tube. So you need to pick the right size for adults or pediatric. I want you to know some of the, one of the materials they can make it out of. So that's silastic tubing. So that's the actual chest tube that's pictured there being inserted in. As you're watching this video, insertion of a chest tube, I want you to think what instruments and supplies do I need to do this? Because you're gonna have to do this at the end of any vats or anything that you're actually entering the lung, you're gonna be putting a chest tube in at the end of that surgery. 
So you need to know how to put in a chest tube quickly for emergent cases. So they may need to put a chest tube in immediately to um, get that negative pressure back into the lungs. Um, and sometimes it's just at the end of a procedure. So you need to know what you need for that um, and what extra supplies you might need. So like what I pictured is a Y connector. So it says in your book, straighter Y connector if more than one chest tube is inserted. So little things like that you have to anticipate. So if you know two chest tubes are going in, you should know to get a Y connector or some type of connector to connect the two tubes to the one collection drainage system. So this is your chest tube. Make sure you watch that video, know what you need and in the correct order. So your notes, so far all you've added is, it could be a silastic uh, chest tube, right? Clurry back, I have more notes for you. So know the supplies you need for the closed sealage drainage system. This is a very old video, but it's fantastic in showing what the circulator needs to do and what the scrub tech needs to do. So as you're studying this, I want you to do separately, maybe watch it twice, know what the scrub tech should do if you're scrubbed in, and know what the circulator should do if you are not scrubbed in. So how to set that up properly. Um, I want you to know that this is um, a water seal drainage system. So that's the first note you need to make. Water seal drainage system. And know why we're doing this chest tube. So why are we doing this chest tube? To reestablish the negative pressure in the pleural cavity. So one more time, we're putting in a chest tube to reestablish negative pressure in the pleural cavity. So that's why this is gonna have a water seal on it. And that's actually part that you get to do as a scrub tech is break that little water that comes with the drainage system and fill it um, into the pleurivac system. A little hard to explain, so you're going to watch the video to make sure that you understand that. Because as you know, we were going to do that in the class, work on chest tubes, and we are not gonna get to do that, unfortunately. So, of course, I'm gonna have it out for you in the lab so you get to hands-on practice it. But for learning, you need to learn that um, at home on your own. So watch both videos, how to do the chest tube and especially how to set up the collection system. So for your notes, hopefully you added for the pleurivac closed seal drainage unit, it's gonna use a water seal to reestablish that negative pressure. Okay. So I've got some more supplies that I want to go over. The next one that I put pictures of is your vascular stapling devices. So I just wanted to point out there's so many different kinds. So there's the one that says articulating battery powered. That's typically used during BATS procedure. So they can make those uh, sharp turns basically to get to where they need to go. And so they can do it through a trocar without having to open the patient. Uh, you can also see the ones that they use on open procedures, the linear stapler, and then the robotic stapler. So those are special for robotic cases. So I wanted to point that out because you've seen a lot of stapling devices and you've probably matched that up in your mind with general surgery because we were doing that to reanastomose bowel most of the time. So now I want you to focus on, we can do that same thing with vessels. So to reanastomose a vessel or to cut something off, you know, to cut that off without there being bleeding, they can staple across a vascular structure. So vascular stapling devices are all pictured there for you. So after that, I get into the anatomy. So I wanna stop at the supplies for a second. Going through this list on 997, the rest of it you should already know. So sponge stick, I love how it says four by four sponges loaded on a sponge stick. Raytech loaded on a sponge stick is a sponge stick. Uh, Kittners on uh, Kelly's or hemostats. Uh, lots of silk ties I talked about. And then your plagiated double armed sutures for anastomosis. We talked about that in peripheral vascular. So again, know that those ideas bleed into this chapter. So keep it all with you. Don't drop that information and hold on to it. That's all I have there. So now I'm ready to hit the anatomy. So you know I'm not supposed to do an anatomy review with you guys, but I added a lot of anatomy on here so that you have good pictures to study. So let me tell you what to study. So for bronchoscopy, first of all, this is gonna be a non-sterile procedure, no incisions required. So we're putting the scope through the mouth. You will see as you study, there's two options, rigid or flexible. I'll go over both. 
look how much anatomy it goes through in the beginning. So I want you to really focus on that and study it. I've added page numbers and pictures for you. So really study this stuff. So study your three divisions of the thorax. Know what all is included in the mediastinum. Know your different parts of your sternum, the manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. Looking at your ribs, know that there's true ribs, false ribs, and then those two floating ribs at the bottom. So those floating ribs just have no attachment to the sternum. So don't forget that as you're studying this anatomy. And then what I think is hard to, harder to understand is the pleura and the difference between the parietal and the visceral pleura um, with the lungs. So I put a picture on here and I'm gonna go over it with you. So just a reminder, your parietal uh, pleura is gonna line the inner surface. And the, here we're talking about the ribs. So inner surface of the ribs, pericardium and the heart. Um, and the visceral pleura, we've already learned visceral is covering an organ, right? But visceral pleura covers the outside surface of each lung. So that pleural space is that space in between the two pleuras, so the parietal and the viscera. And I want you to know what that fluid is in between. So it contains serous, serous fluid, not serious, serous fluid. So that's what prevents that friction from happening as you're breathing and respiration is happening. So respiration, that brings me to the next thing. So I went over pleura. Look at, this picture is for you to study that. Look at respiration. Both of these two links are for you to study respiration. So review how respiration happens and the role of the diaphragm in it. Uh, as far as your inspiration in your book, make sure you know it uses the diaphragm and the external uh, intercostals. Expiration has a long list of muscles that it uses. So internal intercostals, external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis and rectus abdominis. So lots more muscles used on expiration. And then where it says act of respiration, I wanna take a look at your picture, 999 in your book, and I want you to make some notes. Now, if you already remember this, that's fantastic, but some of you might need a review. <clears throat> so letter A, this is showing expiration, so breathing out. Letter B is showing inspiration, so breathing in. So I'm gonna do a little backwards. I'm gonna start with letter B, because that's breathing in. So inspiration, letter B, B, Every time you breathe in, your diaphragm is going to contract. So inspiration, your diaphragm is going to contract. When it contracts, it's actually gonna move downward. So look at that diaphragm picture, it's kind of curved up like this. It's gonna move down. So that's every time you breathe in. Your shoulders might go up, but your diaphragm is gonna go down. So I want you to make that note. Inspiration, diaphragm contracts and it moves downward. So this is making room for the lungs. So do you see the two spots? It says increased side to side dimension, and then it says increased vertical dimension. It's increasing the dimension so that the lungs can expand. So we want the diaphragm to move down out of the way so the lungs can expand as you breathe in, inspiration. Now expiration, so this is breathing out. So now I'm looking at letter A in your book, expiration. So expiration, breathing out, our diaphragm is relaxing. So that's how I want you to link that in your mind so you don't mess this up, because that's what I think. So every time I breathe out, my diaphragm is going and relaxing. It's actually moving up. So it's a little backwards of our normal muscle contractions, and I want you to really study this part. So expiration, the diaphragm relaxes and moves upward. So we breathe out, the diaphragm moved upward, we breathe in, it pushes down and contracts. So last time, expiration, the diaphragm is going to move upward and relax. So that is your inspiration and expiration review I thought I'd do real quick for you. So after that, your anatomy moves on. Uh, like I said, watch both of these videos for more information on mechanism of breathing because you do need to know that for your exam. Okay, now I'll move on. So your anatomy keeps going with the trachea and the bronchial tree after that. So know how far the trachea extends. So from the larynx to um, the bronchi, know what it's, know what the trachea is made of, what it's formed by, that's all review. Look at your bronchial tree. See where it divides, know what that spot is called, the carnea. 
And then a little more detailed with the bronchial tree. So I added a picture here for you. So your bronchial tree is lined with that ciliated mucosa. So it's lined with mucosa and that mucosa is filled with goblet cells. So it's composed of goblet cells. These goblet cells have secretions. These secretions trap the foreign bodies and the foreign particles. So because of that, the cilia pass the particles forward to the throat and you can expel it. So you can cough it out. You can cough those foreign particles out at that point. So understand that process and know what the goblet cells do. After that, just know your bronchial divisions as they separate down. So study this anatomy very well of the bronchial tree all the way down to the alveoli. So the alveoli, hopefully you remember, this is where this oxygen exchange happens. So if you need to make yourself a note, those are the tiny air sacs. And that's where the oxygen exchange happens. So the alveoli are gonna take in oxygen and expel CO2. So make sure you understand that process. After that, uh, it gets to page 1,000. You're gonna go through the lung anatomy and, and the lobe anatomy and then the whole blood flow throughout the lung. So I'm not going over that part. That does not mean you don't have to read it. I just wanted to do a partial anatomy review with you. So make sure you read through everything about the blood flow also. But I'm going to skip to where it says lung damage on page 1001. So this brings me right into bronchoscopy, a rigid bronchoscopy actually. So um, you can see the picture on 1004, but starts talking about it here on page 1001. So stay with me where I'm at in the book. Lung damage. So bronchoscopy is can be diagnostic or therapeutic. You already knew that, but it's very invasive. And for diagnostic, those are people that are going to be coughing up blood sometimes, so hemopetosis. It could also be for infection, carcinoma, endobronchial tumors, postoperative evaluation after a lung transplant, and then most commonly, retrieving a foreign object. So typically children, uh, you know, do, putting things in their mouth that they shouldn't and they breathe it in and it gets enlarged in the bronx somewhere somewhere in the bronchial tree. So we have to go retrieve it. So foreign body removal is what I have pictured here with a rigid endoscope, because that's what they will use. Before I get into that, let's get stay with the cancer. So after all your different options for your bronchoscopy, it keeps on talking about lung damage. So carcinoma of the lung, like I said, leading cause of death due to cancer in the United States. So that is a statistic that has not changed for a very long time, unfortunately. In most cases, lung cancer is a result of cigarette smoking, but that's not always the case. Um, cigarette smoke has those known carcinogens inside of them. So just one, the worst one it wants you to know, polycyclic hydrocarbons. So these substances promote malignancies. So basically you have a lose-lose situation because you have this that's promoting malignancy and then on top of that you have smoke that is irritating the airway. So the two of these combined is a perfect environment for cancer to grow and malignancies to spread. So unfortunately that's why these tumors progress quickly and that's why they get so bad. So for details about lung tumors. So lung tumors are divided into four different subgroups on page 1002. So you can read over those, but I don't want you to focus on the details. I'd rather you focus on the actual procedure of the bronchoscopy. So looking at page 1003, I want you to look at preoperative diagnosis and procedures. So for this part, I want, you, I want to point out that the biopsy that they're going to take in this bronchoscopy is going to be their definitive diagnosis. So they just did maybe a chest x-ray or some other type of imaging and they say, okay, now we need to do a bronchoscope, but they're doing this to get a definitive diagnosis. So even if they have an idea of what it might be, this is their actual diagnosis. You need a specimen to prove it. So definitive diagnosis of tissue made with cytology biopsy from bronchoscopy. So you can watch this on the YouTube channel to see uh, what a bronchoscopy looks like and what it looks like when they take a specimen, especially the brushing, brushings or cytology, but it's going to be hooked up with the suction tube sometimes. 
So that brings me to equipment, instruments, and supplies. You need to highlight, pay attention to biopsy forceps, telpha for specimen, several specimen containers, and Lucan's tube. So your Lucan's tube actually attaches to your suction and it allows the surgeon to use the suction normally and it'll just suck up the specimen into that Lucan's tube. But this has to be done a certain way so that it doesn't get caught up into the actual suction machine. So it has to be done the right way. So you need to know how to handle a Lucan's tube as a circulator and a scrub tech. So I will post a video on YouTube for you guys um, and maybe I'll post it to the Facebook page too so you can study that part. The note you need to make. So Lucan's tube, they're gonna use this for bronchial or mucus washings. So bronchial or sorry, mucosal washings. So this is what they're sending to pathology to see if there's any cancer basically or any other pathology that's going on. Okay, you can see in the picture what you need for this case, right? Scope, camera, light cord. The only thing crazy different that you have not seen is this Hopkins rod. So this Hopkins rod, I've talked to you guys about this before. You can't see it in the picture, but it actually attaches to your Mayo stand. So this is what I was talking about in ENT, kind of like the Jennings mouth gag, how it attaches to the mouth. So if you touch that Mayo stand, you could break some teeth off or damage somebody's jaw or even airway. So you do not want to touch that Mayo stand when a stabling device like the Hopkins rod is attached to it. So again, they're going to take, I, I left out one thing, camera, light cord, scope, bread is what I left out. So in your book, it says antifog solution. So remember the name for that antifog solution is going to be bread. Okay, so you can flip it over, page 1004. So uh, I'm going to go a little more into the details on this one, but I'm going to separate the rigid and the flexible. So because I have the rigid up, I'll do that one first. You need to know as a scrub tech how to assemble it. Now, this isn't something you're going to memorize first time after watching the video, but it's going to be very helpful to have that video in your mind. So when you're an extern and you're putting it together for the first time, you're going to really look like a smart person, like you know what you're doing, because you're going to know some pieces to the puzzle already. So maybe you can partially put it together before getting pointers on how to do it, getting trained on how to do it. It'll make a huge difference for your preceptor. Okay, so what's the same before I go into rigid versus flexible? What's the same? The skin prep and the draping. No skin prep, draping's a three quarter sheet. You're just laying that down to make sure to keep the patient's gown clean. It's not for sterility, non-sterile case. Don't have to worry about that. So look down at practical considerations and separate the rigid scope from the flexible scope, two different bullet points. So we are looking at the rigid scope. So you see all of the things you need to do the case. I want you to know that this is very commonly used for foreign body removal for children. So rigid is typically used foreign body removal for children. And I can use it for lots of other things. You can still take biopsies through this channel um, that's attached that you can see right here. They're going to put that nipple suction cover right here, but you can feed instruments through that. So even though it's very small, you can feed grasping devices through this rigid bronchoscope. Okay, I'm going to, I might have to go back and forth, but the next one. So let's look at our flexible bronchoscope. So next bullet point, it says the smaller diameter flexible fiber optic bronchoscope. Ignore all the details, flexible bronchoscope. So this one you need the tower as you can see with everything that goes with it. A little more convenient as a scrub deck because you don't have as much stuff to get because it's all found on the tower. So really you'll be checking it to make sure it has everything it's supposed to have in it ready to go and restocking it when you're done of course. Uh, so this is your bronchoscope, bronchoscopy, excuse me, cart or tower that you're going to need. Um, I want you to look in your book. So underneath the flexible bronch bronchoscope, you see everything you need for it in my slide, but it starts talking about um, what they're seeing on the x-ray. So that's what I want to point out to you. Because again, we're going to have x-rays in the room for them to verify what they're looking at. So in your book, it says transbronchial lung biopsy. So lung biopsy for examination of pulmonary infiltrate is performed through a flexible bronchoscope. 
pulmonary infiltrate. So it doesn't explain this very well in your book or at all. So pulmonary infiltrate, basically they're seeing dense spots on the x-ray. They're seeing lots of dense spots um, on this chest x-ray. So that's indicating to them that there's some sort of pathology there. So basically that's why we're there for the bronch. They looked at the x-ray, they saw this infiltrate, these very dense spots on the x-ray. Um, so they know there's some sort of substance there, like pus or blood or protein or something. So it's indicating pulmonary pathology to them. So that's why we're going to perform this one through a flexible uh, endoscope. And on both of these procedures, it says it on the next bullet point, on both of these procedures, rigid and flexible, these are non-sterile procedures. Now it points out that the scope can either be sterilized or under high level disinfection. Me personally, I think they should both be sterilized. It's a non-sterile procedure, but why do high level disinfection when you can sterilize it and know that there are zero microbes inside that scope? So. Uh, you don't usually have many times to help with policy change, but if you ever do, always vote for sterilization over high infection, uh, high quality disinfection. Sterilization is always better. But reminder, it's a non-sterile case for both of these. Okay, look at page 1005. So for this, it's telling you what you need to have ready as a script tech for the cytology specimen. So you need to have a 10 mil syringe with five mils of saline, very specific. This is for taking cytologic specimens, so cytology specimens. The surgical tech must be familiar with procedure for taking the fluid washings uh, when performing a flexible bronchoscopy in order to prevent the specimen from being lost through the suction. So this is what I was talking about, that Lucan's tube can be attached to the suction to take the specimen, but if you don't take it off in time, then it can suck the specimen into the suction machine. So the same, the same idea can happen with the flexible bronchoscope, even if they're not using a Lucan's tube. Sometimes they'll stick an, a second tube down there of suction and say, this is gonna be specimen. Well, you need to unplug that tube and get it into a specimen cup very quickly. So lots of communicating with your circulator about the specimens on these cases. So again, make sure you watch a YouTube video about Lucan's tube and how to deal with cytologic specimens. All right, now I get to do a little visual for you guys, maybe. I think you can see me in the corner, actually. So I'm gonna show you what it's talking about in your book. So look at your last bullet point before it gets into the surgical procedure on page 1005. So it says, lung tissue specimens are friable. The scrub tech should take care of removing the specimens from the jaw of the biopsy forcep using a 22 gauge needle. So this is not something you're used to, right? We don't play with needles for no reason. So I got some supplies from my kitchen to show you. So these biopsy forceps are like cups, right? So they take a biopsy and they pull it out, but it's very, very small. So there's a cup on either end of these biopsy forceps. So this is the smallest little cup I could find in my kitchen, but out of this cup, it's going, basically gonna be on both ends, but they take their specimen, it's inside here, right? It's in the cup but it's so tiny, it's maybe a 16th of this size. It's so tiny that you as the script tech have to shine the light on it and then get your 22 gauge needle and force that specimen out of there onto the Telfa patty and then into the specimen cup and then sent to your circulator so they can get it off the field. So that is what it's talking about in your book. Yes, that is how it is done. So it's done with a 22 gauge needle, very safely of course, to get that specimen out. Your other option, of course, is for the surgeon to tap it into the cut. The problem with that is it's a very small specimen, and if they don't have any more specimen to grab, that is very, uh, that's too dangerous. What if you lose that little bitty piece of specimen uh, while you're trying to tap that out? That's too dangerous. So that's why it's a little better sometimes because that 22 gauge needle and get that specimen out of there because there may not be any other tissue to take. And what if it's cancer? We have to know that. So that's why your 22 gauge needle is used for that. So make sure you know that. Uh, the next thing is just to have four or five specimen containers ready to go prior to the start of the procedure. So it's telling you they're gonna take lots of specimens. So just be ready for that. As far as the procedure, I'm not gonna go through it because you can see in the pictures what they're gonna do. They're going to take a look um, in the bronch and see 
you know, sometimes it'll be taking a foreign body and sometimes it'll be taking a specimen. So it just depends on what you're doing. So make sure you watch some of these YouTube videos and look at the differences between them. But that is bronchoscopy for you. So that leads me into mediastinoscopy. So I'm on page 1007. So mediastinoscopy. So this one is a sterile procedure. You don't have to worry about sterile versus non-sterile on this one. We're making an incision near the trachea, so or the supersternal notch to be specific. So it's a sterile procedure. So mediastinoscopy is performed for evaluation of nodule involvement or mediastinal masses with patients with lung carcinoma. So basically patients with lung cancer that we think that it has spread to their lymph nodes or that maybe they have another mediastinal mass, that's why we're gonna do a mediastinoscopy to take a look and possibly some biopsies. So that's what we're gonna be doing. For your studying, know that, uh, know what's typical of these lesions. So typical of these lesions found within the mediastinum. It gives you a couple names, but I want you to focus on the details. So thymomas, uh, lymphomas, and germ cell tumors. But here's the details I want you to focus on. These mass lesions tend to be enterogenous cysts, lymphomas, neurogenic tumors, or pleuropericardial cysts. So know all of those options. So that's what, that's what it typically is going to be. So this is what's going to be biopsy during your procedure if they find it. So now that you know that, look at your pre-op diagnosis same procedures. They're definitely going to need a CT scan for this one to see these soft tissues. Looking at your equipment, instruments, and supplies, biopsy forceps. So we're going to be taking a biopsy. The rest of the stuff you should already know. So flip it over, preoperative preparation. So for your pre-op prep, it's telling you where the incision is. So that super sternal notch where the incision is made all the way to the border of the mandible to mid chest, including the entire neck. So we're going to do a very widespread prep, even though we know where we're making that incision by the trachea. So mediastinoscopy, look at your practical considerations. This is a sterile procedure. It is preferable that the mediastinoscope should be sterilized rather than using high-level disinfection. Well, you know how I feel about this. It should be sterilized and not using high-level disinfection technique. So this is a sterile procedure. Make sure you have a scope that has been sterilized, not just under that high-level disinfection. <laughs> so this one's short and sweet, so I will go through the procedure with you. So surgical procedure number one, 15 blade, small incision transverse at the suprasternal notch. So it's carried down to the platysma muscle. So you get to see the platysma and that suprasternal notch. After that, it's gonna expose the trachea. So you get to see the trachea, then they can insert that mediastinoscope. So it's got a flat edge on it, as you can see in this picture. So it won't do any damage and can lay flat against that trachea. So the mediastinoscope is entered, and then from there they can visualize the lymph nodes, that tracheal bifurcation, and of course the bronchial tree or part of the bronchi. So from there they can take their uh, tissue specimens. So you'll get those biopsy forceps and take the tissue specimens of those lymph nodes. So that's your mediastinoscopy. Here is your setup so you can see what that scope looks like. And you can see all of the grasping forceps and biopsy forceps in the back, back of the basket ready to go there. So this was on your bronchoscopy, but it didn't focus on it on the mediastinoscopy. So that's the only reason I added it to the side here. So for mediastinoscopy setup, you still need, just like for the bronchoscopy, your biopsy forceps, telfa, and uh, that's for your specimen. So you still might need that 22 gauge needle that I talked about to get the specimen out of that biopsy forcep, but it's always gonna go on a telfa because it's gonna be a very small specimen that they're barely gonna be able to see. So they're gonna put it on that shiny telfa dressing inside a specimen cup. Okay, that brings me to VATS. So video assisted thoracic surgery. So thoracoscopy or VATS. So VATS, I'm going to try to do basic, but VATS could be so many different things. So they could do a 
wedge lung resection through VATS. They could um, do anything for diseases and disorders of the esophagus, lungs, the mediastinum. So there's just lots of different things they could do with VATS. So I'll go over two of those, I think, but know that there's lots of different options for VATS. So again, minimally invasive, right? We're avoiding doing a big open chest surgery on this person so that we can do minimally invasive. Because of that, positioning is very important. If they're not in the right position, sometimes I have seen it where we were prepped, draped, ready to go, and the surgeon scrubbed in, palpated, and said, I can't feel, and the drape is covering where I'd like to make my incision. You did a bad job positioning, let's start over. So I protected my sterile field, they ripped off the drapes, we got all new drapes and everything. My poor circulator was running in circles because they did a bad job positioning the patient. Positioning is very important for these cases. So take a look at this slide, uh, how the beanbag is positioned. Um, also this blue arm board that's out to the side because the patient, one patient, uh, one arm might be out because they're so lateral to make them comfortable. Um, you're also gonna move the headpiece of the bed to the foot. So really pay attention to the positioning on this one because your book didn't, so I did it for you. So there's your positioning stuff, but I actually want to take a pause and look in your book at page 1009. So you know what VATS can be used to diagnose and treat. I want you to look at some of the plural disorders that it can diagnose and treat. So it talks about blebs and cysts. So you know what cysts are? Blebs are those irregular bulges and they're usually air-filled sacs. So you can see both of those and they can take biopsies of those. Um, and mediastinal masses. So it's really three different things that you might come across, but two are plural disorders, the plebs and the cysts. Um, like I said, the procedures with these VATs could be lung wedge, wedge resection, lobectomy, pericardial window, thymectomy. So that's removing your thymus. So, so many options for your VATs. Um, it's also indicated when the patient has impaired pulmonary function. So basically, if the risks of open surgery outweigh um, the pathology, that's really what's more important. So what it's telling you is some of our patients are too sick to have open surgery. So that's why we're doing VATS. We're doing minimally invasive instead. Okay, flip it over to page 1010. So for VATS, you know what you need. I've gone over so many times what you need to do any type of a case that ends in oscopy. So I'm gonna to try to stop doing that. So know everything you need to do a minimally invasive case. Let's look at the stuff that's different. So you'll see that even though it's thoroscopy, you're gonna have a minor instrument tray open. This is to get some basic instrumentation like peon clamps and cushing vein retractors. Uh, you'll still have all your endoscopic instruments. You also have a major cardiovascular instrument set available or in the OR. So that is on the slide for a reason. So that means we're working on the chest near the heart. Something could go wrong. We need to have a thoracotomy set available. I actually worked at one facility that every time we did a VATS, we had the thoracotomy tray open and counted. So that means a lot of the times it went to waste. I never touched it. It never got a drop of blood on it. But if we had to go open, we were ready to go. Our patient was not in danger because it was already open, counted, ready to go. So we didn't have to rush and worry about the patient's safety as much. So every facility is different, but at the very minimum, you need to have the major cardiovascular instrument set in the OR, be ready to convert to an open thoracotomy. So you're going to start with a sternal saw anytime you're talking about cracking the chest to get to the heart. So it could be a little different, it could be more involved. I, anything to do with the heart, lung, chest, I have the crash cart in the room ready to go. So make sure you are communicating on what uh, emergency equipment you want available in the room for these cases. Uh, after that, the stuff that's different chest tube. So I've already taught you guys about that and you need to watch both of the videos to understand all the details. But you'll see the end of this case, you need a chest tube and a plurivac closed water seal drainage system. So again, they're just going to call it a plurivac 
So there's lots of different names. I try to throw all the different names at you in the lecture. So you're familiar with it when you hear it. So chest tube, after that, you can look at pre-op preparation. So position is gonna be lateral, and I told you very much uh, varies uh, depending on the surgeon and where exactly they're making the incision. So positioning is important. They'll still use that double lumen endotracheal tube because we're working on the lung. Skin prep is gonna be as far as possible, and you'll see on the patient right here, they have the incised drape on them. So they have the IO band on the patient, and does everybody see this green sponge right here? I hope you can see me circling it. This green sponge that is attached to the patient is your FRED. So your anti-fog solution is going to be squirted onto that sponge. It's countable. So then at any point, the surgeon can just take their camera out of this trocar, rub it on the anti-fog, and reinsert re the scope back into the patient. So, because again, the room is cold and the patient is warm, right? So you have that temperature change and it fogs up the camera. Okay, let's look at practical considerations. So the surgical tech should be ready to convert to open. We already know that. The surgical tech should be prepared to assess the surgeon with intraop complications of VATS. So this is why I said have the crash cart in the room ready to go. This includes air embolus, injury to the diaphragm, and hemorrhage, all, can, all of which can be reasons to convert to an open procedure. So any of these bad things that can happen, you convert to an open procedure. So that's a good time to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. So you're already ready to switch to an open procedure. I will quickly go through this procedure actually. So looking at number one on page 1011. Incision between the fourth and seventh intercostal space, very specific, you need to know that. This is at the posterior axillary line. The next part that you need to know. Digital examination is completed to verify entrance into the pleural cavity. They're gonna use their finger to make sure they're in the pleural cavity. That's all they are doing and you need to know that part. After that is when the surgery can really start. So I'm gonna skip through these numbers and say, they're gonna insert four trocars. Same pattern every time. So local anesthetic, knife, trocar. After that, whatever working instrument or camera that they're going to put inside. So all four incisions are made, four ports are put in. It's gonna be the same pattern every time. Local knife port, local knife port. So you should have it ready in that order. It's the very beginning of the procedure. They should not have to wait on you. You should 100% anticipate their needs. So I'm gonna to skip to number six. So after you got all your ports in and your camera is inserted, then they're going to insert a grasper to grab the lung and retract it. So again, this procedure of VATS, it says at the beginning of the page, it's not just a VATS that they're talking about. This is talking about a VATS wedge resection. So we're taking out a piece of lung and sending it as specimen. So grasper is inserted, the lung is grabbed and retracted. Number seven, they're going to take a piece of that lung out. They're gonna use an endoscopic stapler to do it. At the bottom, the last sentence, it says, this process will be repeated several times until all major, major vessels have been divided. So that means you need to have more stapler loads ready to go. So the slide where I went over stapling devices, hopefully you can see the colored portion where the actual staples are coming out. That's the load. That's the part that you as a scrub tech are going to have to load and unload every time before and after using it. So you need to be constantly communicating with them. Do we need another load? We're just watching them, seeing that there's another vessel that needs to be stapled. So instead of asking, just telling your circulator, I need another load, please. So watching the surgery can help you anticipate what they're gonna need next. But you can also just communicate. Sometimes from the beginning of the case, if I knew the surgeon well, I could say, how many loads do you think you'll need? So they can already anticipate what their plan is and let you know. But you need to always have more stable loads in the room for these types of cases. So that's why your procedural consideration right after that, it says the ST will need to quickly refill the stapler when it's empty in order to avoid delays. So sometimes they have that grasper on something very delicate and they are holding it just right. And when they finally get it, they say, okay, stapler. So if you don't have that stapler ready to go when they're holding it just right, you will be delaying the case and possibly hurting the, 
that patient because they have it just right. They're ready for it now. So endoscopic staplers are something you want to play with as soon as you get a chance when you're scrubbed in so you know how to load them um, very quickly for your surgeon. Okay, after that, they have used their endoscopic stapler. Using graspers and scissors, they can take some lymph nodes too. So they'll take lymph nodes and biopsy that. That's number eight. After that, they're going to send, send uh, to pathology these specimens. So procedural consideration number eight. This is the question you have to ask if you get two pieces out at the same time. Do you want this sent together or separate? Now we already know the three questions to ask about specimens anyways, right? But that's a little different when they pull out of the trocar two separate pieces. So instead of your, what is this? It's going to be, what is this and what is this? Are they the same thing? Or are they two separate? If so, what's the two separate names? Very particular on this. That could be a huge difference in somebody's cancer treatment. Please don't forget that. So if they tell you exact anatomy of where this is from versus this one, you have to write that down immediately so you don't get them mixed up. Because think about their cancer treatment later on. That's how they're deciding where to radiate or whether to start chemo. It all starts with you intra-op. You are the one holding that specimen for the first time and handing it off to the circulator. Whatever you tell the circulator is what it is and that's how it's gonna be treated. So it's very important, especially with lung cancer. So after your specimen is off the field labeled correctly, uh, the wedge of lung tissue is going to be removed completely after that. So it tells you on number 10 how they're going to do that. It says the tissue specimen bag is rolled up and inserted. If you remember, I taught you guys what this is already. It's called an endocatch. So your endocatch, uh, you heard about um, laparoscopic appendectomies and laparoscopic cholecystectomies. So same thing, it's a bag to catch your specimen. Uh, look at your procedural consideration. There's another reason they use this. So this bag prevents the spread of infectious fluid and the seeding of malignant cells. So they want to do this to prevent cancer cells from spreading. That's why having the endocatch is very important for this case. Flip it over, page 1012. Uh, so look at number 12. So after they've checked for bleeding and everything, they are going to insert a chest tube. So after they insert the chest tube into the pleural cavity, they're going to hook it up to the plurivax system. So if you are adding notes, you can go ahead and add plurivac drainage system to the end so you understand that that's the collection device. And then where the chest tube is going into the pleural cavity. Because we just worked on the lung, right? So we have eliminated that negative pressure that is supposed to be within the lungs. We need that negative pressure back. So we are going to insert a chest tube to get that back into the pleural cavity. Uh, number 13, they're going to remove all the trocars and close it up. So that's your, that's procedure for a wedge resection. You can see your setup right here for VATS. Very different depending on the scrub tech. So this one's got the long, um, these look like graspers instead of foresters, but they're going to be doing the same thing. Extra long instruments. You see the extra long suctions. I see the atrium uh, plurivac plur system right here. And on this one, they have the trocars ready to go. Probably that needle right there to get the specimen out of some of these biopsy forceps. So this is your setup for VATS. So that kind of brings me into the next one that I'm going to go over quickly because it's still a VATS. So it's a VATS, but just for something specific. So pectus ecfactum is a repair that they can do with VATS. So here's what I want to go over. Your pathology goes into a lot of details. So you need to know that. So it's most common congenital deformity of the chest. It gives you a funnel shape of your chest that's an asymmetrical depression, but I'm gonna put it in layman's terms for you. It says it's a posterior displacement of the sternal body. Your sternum is too far back, so it gives your body this funnel shape. So because of that, it could, they could be doing the surgery for cosmetic reasons, they could also be doing it because it's hurting their breathing or it's not allowing them to fully expand their lungs and breathe correctly because that sternum is so far posterior. So multiple different reasons to do this case, but it's still a VATS procedure. 
So I'm gonna go through the procedure. Instead, I will say, look at this anatomy, the pathology, and study it. Know the deformity usually affects four to five ribs on each side of the sternum. Know that it can get even more involved and involve the vertebral column. Know some of the symptoms like bronchospasm, dysrhythmias, chest pain, difficulty breathing, and know when they do the surgical repair. So surgical repair before the age of five years old produces the best results. So look at page 1014. You'll see the position is supine. Sometimes they'll have the chest um, slightly elevated because that's what we're gonna be working on. We're of course gonna have that double lumen ET tube because we're working near the lung. And then the one thing that's different, epidural catheter inserted preoperatively in order to provide post-op pain control. So as you can see, this is usually children, so they're gonna want that post-op pain control so that they can be comfortable. So instead of going through this procedure, I'm gonna flip to page 1015. I'm gonna point out some special items you'll need for it. So you see the picture um, underneath, so letter B, you can see the pectus bar, what they're gonna do. They're gonna put a big bar in the chest. I want you to think, scrub tech, what extra items am I gonna need? So number six, you're gonna need umbilical tape. Umbilical tape will be used to guide the pectus bar through this tunnel that they're making in the chest. Then look at number eight. After they get this pectus bar into the chest, just know what it's actually doing for the patient, not the rest of the details. It's going to raise the sternum and the anterior chest wall into the desired anatomical position. So it's putting the sternum back where they would like it to be. So either the patient can breathe well or that you have that cosmetic effect that you wanted of the natural looking chest and that funnel shape is now gone. Looking at number nine, they're gonna either add some stabilizer plates or they'll use steel wire like we use to wire the sternum shut normally to close this up. But other than that, it is a VATS procedure and there's nothing else different with that. So that is the end of my uh, lecture for today. So I will go over the rest of thoracic and pulmonary surgery next time. But if you have any questions, of course, comment below and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Thanks guys.